I'm going to introduce one of the uh, writers. I'm sure you all have seen the show, Penn and Teller, Tell a Lie. This is, uh, please make him feel welcome. This is Matt Donnelly. How's it going, everybody? Good evening. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to be moderating uh, today's discussion. And uh, please, welcome to the stage your guests for the last uh, 38 years. They have been defying the laws of physics and also sometimes good taste. <laughs> please welcome to the stage Penn and Teller. <laughs> That's how hypocritical Penn and Teller are. Do a whole show against bottled water, then they come out with bottled water. <laughs> we actually dump these out and put tap. Uh, and let's just be clear, uh, just for today's discussion, Teller, you are indeed Mike, so you'll be speaking uh, to everybody here today. <laughs> All right, and uh, to start things off, I saw you guys talking with Randy just before we came out on stage here. Um, talk about a little bit, let's talk about Randy. Uh, did you all know of him before you got together or was it after you got together when you, when you kind of discovered Randy and, and your admiration for Randy? That uh, information has been lost. <laughs> uh, the three of us tell stories of Randy and how we met and I believe all three of us tell different stories, do you? Somebody was really arrogant, like, sure, I'll Mike Teller. Sure, why not? <laughs> yeah, let me see here, hold on a second, we got this? This is just really wicked fun. Uh -huh. <laughs> Strangely, I have some information. <laughs> It's just, uh, it, it's, it was odd, but I was looking through some ancient notebooks of mine today, and I found a letter, uh, a, a draft of a letter to Randy saying that we were going to be at the, uh, the, this, this conference for college bookings, and oh, yeah. that we were dying to meet him. I, that's all I can say. So we, we, we knew he was going to be there. It wasn't a random encounter, and it was a sort of a fan letter to him. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I know that while I was in high school, I don't know, because they're gonna, someone's going to tell me that it's a different year, but I believe when I was in high school, I read Flim Flam. Okay. And Randy had already started changing my life. But the way Randy tells the story is that he put us together. And uh, <laughs> I, I would say that that's the lie that tells the greater truth. <laughs> I mean, um, if we hadn't both been fans of Randy, we wouldn't get together. And certainly, and I've said this many times, it's just simply true, that uh, if not for Randy, there would not be Penn and Teller as we are today. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Uh, the, um, you know, uh, I've told this story so many times, I, I won't tell it now, but um, I, uh, as a child, was very, very bothered by Kreskin and humiliated by Kreskin, and um, uh, I actually lost uh, all of my respect for science and all of my respect for magic. I didn't have a lot for magic, but I mean, <laughs> the, the little bit that I had, I lost. And, um, and it was Teller and Randy together that gave me um, the piece of information I needed. And uh, I didn't understand before hours of conversation with Teller and reading a lot of Randy, then meeting Randy, that you could take the worst Thing possible, which is lying uh, to people knowingly, and make that an okay thing by putting a proscenium around it. And whether uh, whether you want to use any of the cliches of honest liar or any of those things, however you put that, the idea that to say that you're a taxi driver when really you're an actor is an immoral thing to do, unless you're doing a movie called Taxi Driver and you're Robert De Niro. And when it's in the, in the theater, it's okay. So uh, Teller and I work really hard to um, not tell lies, but do magic, which, is, uh, which I didn't understand how that was possible until I uh, 
met Teller and Randy. So it's kind of, Teller was much hipper to all uh, the kind of nuances of when it's okay to lie and when it's not. But I was very, very confused by that. And uh, Teller and Randy kind of uh, led me by the hand. And uh, Randy was just, you know, I've said this many times, outside of my family, outside of people genetically related to me, um, no one is more important in my life. Uh, Randy's everything to me. That's amazing. That is amazing. And, and last night, right word. he referred to you guys as brothers. So I know that the feeling is he said mutual. He, he said something more important than that. Did you hear what he said last night? After we did to Sir with Love, he said, I love them like brothers. I love them like lovers. Oh. And uh, that's when I started crying last night. Because uh, that's... The, that ramps it up a wicked lot for me. Sure does. And it gets hotter for everyone else. <laughs> um, so tell her, let's talk a little bit about this. So, so when he talks about cl when it's okay to lie or how to lie in magic, you got into magic very early on. So when did the ethics of doing magic play in your development of magic? Uh, almost not until I met Penn, really. Uh, and, and Penn, uh, I, I, magic didn't, didn't have for me a moral component I think until I hung with Penn, who is, as you know, very clear in his morality. Um, <laughs> um, if for me, I was I was fascinated by by magic because the most important decision that you make in your life at any given moment is what is really going on there. You can't make any decisions beyond that until you make that decision. And magic is this wonderful place where if you make, if you make a mistake on that in real life, if, you, if, you, if you're in a situation and you don't really know what's going on uh, and you don't think there's a truck coming at you and the truck uh, is there and it comes at you and you make a mistake about that, that can be a very fatal sort of thing. If you go to the car dealership and the car dealer lies to you and you buy a bad car, that's a very severe thing. If, on the other hand, your, uh, it, it, what magic does is magic allows you to play with that most difficult of all, with that, that most important possible decision in a situation where it doesn't matter. In fact, it's a situation where if you get it wrong, if you don't know where reality is and, and make-believe begins, you're perfectly happy with it because you're, you're just there to have fun. It's like a, it's like a playground for that particular skill uh, that is so important elsewhere. Great. And now, when it comes to... <laughs> What's great about that, Matt? That was, great. that was just great. That's my... I took a, uh, a transition class, and great was the first lesson. <laughs> I, 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 I always excelled at, uh-huh. Oh, good, yeah. Uh-huh. I'm going to... I'll go to lesson two if you want. Fascinating. <laughs> no, um, so... No, and so, you know, being in, you know, the skeptic, atheist community, bringing that into your work, you know, that you were into entertainment first... Talk about, you know, the, the, you know, growing up as entertainers and then becoming kind of skeptic or atheist entertainers. Well, that's not true for me. Okay. I, I, was, uh, I was much more interested in atheism and skepticism than I was in children. Okay. I, I mean, it was a juggler, which is, you know, the, it, it is the lowest level of show business possible. <laughs> the only people we can look down upon are ventriloquists and hypnotisms. <laughs> that's it. So I was a, you know talent show juggler, and I knew that I, um, I, I, I lacked enough musical ability to be successful in that. I, I, I didn't think I had enough comedy ability to be successful there. I mean, Steve Martin once said, if you desperately want to be in show business and don't really have talent, you become a magician. And um, <laughs> uh, I didn't desperately want to be in show business. I desperately wanted to be a writer. And what I cared about, uh, my overwhelming passion, uh, was atheism, and out of that came uh, came skepticism. So what we were really seeing, I mean, Teller really did love magic. I had, uh, I don't think I had even even the slightest bit of affection for magic when I met you. Um, uh, not much. I mean, the only interest I have in magic is the stuff that Teller told me was good about magic. The idea that um, magic could be an intellectual art form because it has built-in irony. And this, I'm just parroting things that Teller said to me, um, but that uh, you had the intellectual engagement of what's real. And the nutty thing is, you can't understand what a radical, ins insanely 
profound thing that was to say when Teller said it to me, because this was the time of uh, Doug Henning and David Copperfield and these people that came out and said, what we're doing here in magic is this, I had a dream last night, and this is what I felt. <laughs> uh, and they would have, you know, their dreams always involved mutilating women. Uh, <laughs> with, with, you know, with fluffy clouds and tie-dye and woo! And uh, Teller pointed out that the idea of magic is the fact that there's trickery there. You're not trying to tell, uh, the, maybe I should let Teller just do this, but Teller talks about the unwilling suspension of disbelief. Uh, when you watch Shakespeare, Shakespeare writes, you know, here we are in this scene, or as Johnny Thompson says, here we are in Spain. And you believe that the actor is, you play along with it. But magic you don't play along with. You're supposed to watch magic with a chip on your shoulder. So automatically, you're dealing with, as Teller said, the difference between reality and, uh, and, and falsehood, and you're dealing with that particular idea. So even the stupidest magic trick, you know, the, the suckiest mentalism, automatically has some sort of political and moral component because you are dealing with what is truth, which is precisely what Teller was saying. And, um, what is truth is a really profound thing. And magicians just piss that away. Once you say to people, just come with me on this journey, here's a dream that I had, let's just make believe, then you don't need to be doing magic. There's no reason to. It's only the unwilling suspension of disbelief that's fascinating. And tell her telling me that magic was essentially intellectual, not the lowest form of art, but rather a rather uh, high up form of art got me interested. When I was, the magic that I watched on TV, you know what I've said a zillion times, a greasy guy in the tux with a lot of birds torturing women to bad rip off white boy small dick Motown music was, uh, <laughs> was just repulsive to me. I mean when I would watch Ed Sullivan, uh, when the magician came on, I was just waiting to see the who. You know, I didn't care about I didn't care about the magicians. I was looking at the rock and roll bands in between. And Teller got that idea that you could say the word trick and celebrate the word trick and get rid of words like effect and illusion. Even even the dumbest dove act has an automatic intellectual component because you're always looking at it with your eyes and measuring what you see against what you know. And that's the fun of it. The fun of it is you measure what you see against what you know, those two things come into collision with each other, and there's a little explosion that can, that's, that's of, has some emotional content, even if it's a crappy act, which is why the, I mean, Steve, Steve Martin's suggestion that magic is a very, uh, very low, you know, it's the, it's the form that you can, you can do if you've got no talent elsewhere, is, is really correct because people get work just coming out and doing tricks and even doing tricks with horrible narratives. They come out and do these horrible... Horrible narratives? You look at me? <laughs> <laughs> with the horrible narratives that Penn was alluding to. <laughs> I didn't say horrible narrators. Um, but because the form is intrinsically so strong, they, they, can, they continue to work. So it's really, it's a terribly, terribly rich form that there's a terrible pile of crap in. Now, Teller, I mean, you're also, I don't know if magic historian is too strong of a term, but you're aware of a lot of history of magic and tricks. And this is an old fight, isn't it? The magic either being saying, I do have superpowers, or magic being the kind of thing that serves a greater good or uh, you know, can speak to skepticism or being smarter. Right. Well, I, for a long time, there was there was confusion about whether the guy who was on the street corner was doing tricks or whether he might have some connection with the devil. And uh, the first time that, that was articulated in English was in 1584, when Reginald Scott, who was a uh, a, a smart guy uh, who was working under the realm of King James, who was a, a, a crackpot, uh, uh, you know, a crackpot who believed there was a witch under every rock, and Reginald Scott dared to say, you know, it's actually sometimes when you see those guys on the street corner who are pretending to cut their arms off, they're using gimmick knives like this, and he put a little diagram in his book, so naturally King James took the opportunity to have every possible copy of Reginald Scott's book burned. Um, so, so that, I mean, that, that, the, the question of whether lying is there or not is a fairly old one. Yeah. 
It's so much safer to trash King James than you but nowadays. <laughs> I was, uh, that's Teller telling truth to power. <laughs> he, called, he called the 16th century king a crackpot. <laughs> it happened here. Yeah. This year. Damn. Yeah, we're not afraid. Yeah, blows against the empire. Revolution starts now. <laughs> Uh, now, now, you guys come Go ahead and mock me, but would you have come up with a better answer to that question, Penn? <laughs> no! I was going to have the same one, except with all the wrong dates and the wrong name. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's the essential difference between us. I fill in these little gaps that don't matter to me, like the date and what the person actually said and who they were. <laughs> Incidentally, King James was famous for publishing a book, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you guys start to hit in New York as a do, when you start to become, you know, a pretty big deal, let's say, you know, there, there's a tendency in artists to really kind of scale back their beliefs or scale back their kind of underlying tones and just kind of go with their entertainment form first. Was that the case with you guys? Were you always outspoken? as atheists and skeptics while you were also starting to become famous as a comedy magic duo? It's been the exact opposite with us. Uh, we, were, we were more careful early on and uh, we are the kinds of, kind of guys that if you, if you give us more rope, we will hang ourselves. I mean, we, <laughs> we, we, we always have been. I mean, uh, when we speak at these things, I think it's happened other years, uh, someone often stands up and says something very kind about uh, our, our, our bravery in speaking out about atheism. And um, the fact of the matter is that the more we've talked about atheism, the more money we've made. Uh, uh, we haven't, and I, I don't mean, please, I know that people suffer for atheism and skepticism and in very real ways with their families, with their jobs. There's real persecution that I'm not in any way belittling. I am just saying that we haven't experienced that. Uh, in our particular uh, trajectory, we haven't had, um, I mean, I'm sure that there have been uh, people, I've been, I mean, I've been attacked more for not being a liberal than I have for being an atheist. Uh, and um, I'd lost jobs and stuff for that. But for atheism, really, really none that I know of. Uh, when we were a three-person group, uh, we, we were the Asparagus Valley Cultural Society from 70-something to 80 something. 75 to 81? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, we had a uh, three person group with a third member named, uh, Weir Christopher. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, Weir was a, uh, was a Lutheran uh, minister's son and was a religious man. And so we first did those few things because it was a three person group and we had to be respectful to, to everyone's feelings on that, we had to stay away from anything religious to, to, in order for, for the group to function. When the group split up, which is a very odd way to look at it, when there's a three-person group and two people go off to work together, you can see it another way besides just splitting up. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> to, to go away to work together in a screamingly atheist project. Yeah. Called, called Mrs. Lonsberry's Seance of Horror, which was uh, not Christian. And when we, <laughs> when, we were, we were, when we were away from him, we then started to, uh, to, be, uh, to, be, to be more, uh, more out of, I mean, we were always very, very uh, outspoken atheists in our personal lives. Right. But we started doing it a little more um, professionally. And, uh, you know, there, there is, and, and, and Teller started it uh, with this, but there are two distinct schools of thought in magic. I mean, uh, we have had long discussions with David Blaine, who believes, uh, and we like him, we get along with him, but artistically, he really believes that the purpose of magic tricks is to obscure where the trick begins, is to bleed out into the world so that people may think you have supernatural powers. It's not that David Blaine is, uh, is not caring about this stuff. It's that he has a different opinion. He believes that his job is to make people have misconceptions about reality, and specifically misconceptions about him. He, he really seems to believe that. And 
I believe, we believe, that that is not only artistically wrong, but morally wrong. That we believe, and this is something I've had a lot of trouble with, I believe that sawing a person in half is the, is the moral point in, in a magic act. Nobody, except someone who is severely mentally ill or a very young child, leaves after seeing someone sawn in half on stage and thinks that someone can be sawn in half without consequences. Nobody leaves the theater like that. And I believe that is the moral line for all magic performance, which means if you're doing mentalism, you cannot say you're reading body language, you cannot say you're reading tone of voice, you must keep it that way. And I will also tell you that that's the ideal, and not tell her, but I have broken that, and I have screwed up and not done that properly, and I'm always trying to fix it, and always fighting with that, because I believe that that's the ideal of where we're gonna go. But uh, a lot of times skeptics and skeptic magicians will consider that um, out of magic comes skepticism, and then your job is to tell people that this is tricks, and this is real, and that decision has to be made. And that's not true. The other magicians are not just um, uh, making a mistake from what they believe is right. They have an actual different moral position and different artistic position than we do. And it, and it bothers me very much. But there are magicians who um, are good magicians and know tricks and can do tricks that are then also believers. I talked with Randy for a long time about Doug Henning, who, uh, whether you liked him or not, he's the most important magician in the 70s, and changed the whole view of magic. It was very, very powerful. And he believed that with TM, he would be able to levitate. I mean, here is the person that had done fake levitations and believed there were also real ones. And there are a huge number of people who are just on the cusp, people who believe that they may really have a little bit of ESP but have to help it along with a trick. So it's not an easy line, it's a very easy line to draw for me, but right. it's not an easy line to draw in the world. And artistically, it always perplexes me, beyond description, when a mentalist says, say, leaves it ambiguous about whether what he's doing is a trick or not. Because if you really could read minds, then there'd be, that you wouldn't want to give that person credit. Right? It's just a natural, a natural thing. It's like I'm, I'm on stage and uh, I'm claiming that I'm five foot eight tall. I mean, it would just be a fact. There's nothing to praise about somebody just doing what it is that they are naturally able to do. It's, it's being able to do, to appear to do what, what you're doing without doing it. That is the achievement. It's the achievement of all art. You know, it, it, you can look at the scene and that doesn't. You don't get credit for that. You take that scene and you turn it into a canvas, that's something worth applauding for. So I just cannot ever imagine why people make the choice of not being able to, to take the, the applause for what they're really doing. Well, you know, just one, one little slight difference of opinion there. Um, Ron Jeremy really could blow himself, and that was cool. <laughs> And people have paid there's to see it. There's no arguing with that. <laughs> uh, but I, but I saw him do it. I mean, you guys talk about it like But it's cool. But do you, do you give him that much credit for it? Yes! Okay. <laughs> you, know how, you know how you can tell I can't blow myself? Because I'm sitting here. <laughs> I forget my next question. <laughs> uh, no, but you guys, uh, you, you know, you define the line so, so distinctly, but yet in magic, you, kinda, you guys have a reputation for kind of rebelling against that, right? I mean, you guys kind of ticked off magicians or ticked off the magic community over Rebelling the against blowing ourselves? No. <laughs> uh, that, was, uh, that was overwhelmed, mostly a lie. The, um, the there were some it. amateur magicians uh, who were a little upset about us. But when we hit um, New York in the 80s, we very much wanted to do a magic show that wouldn't be for the same audience as magic shows. And magic shows had a very, uh, uh, they still do, you know, a very cheesy kind of view. And we wanted to pull people out of that. We wanted to do 
a, a PR hype thing of doing a magic show in New York City that was just a magic show, but passing it off as something postmodern as a magic show, something beyond that. And the way we accomplished that was by talking about how much magicians hated us so that the audience would say, well, this is something different from magicians. And what we would do, and this is so, um, uh, so disingenuous, so unpleasant, so cheesy, so opportunistic, and so self-serving, and I'm rather proud of it. Uh, <laughs> we would find some guy who had a, you know, a mimeographed <laughs> newsletter, a Xerox newsletter, that went out to like a thousand people, you know, and some guy, who was going out to a thousand people would write a paragraph about seeing us and thinking that we were terrible. You know, he'd write something like, the worst thing to happen in the 20th century. Something just insanely stupid. Like World War II blew by this guy. And um, <laughs> he wrote about how we sucked, okay? And it went out to a thousand people. Then we would give that quote to David Letter, who would go out in front of eight million people and say, this is what they're writing about them. They are persecuted. Here they are, Penn and Teller. So, a thousand people against eight million people, and we're the victim. You know, we're, we're the ones who are in trouble because these terrible, and why are magicians saying these terrible things about you? Well, Dave, and then we do our little bit, Dave. Then tell our, you know, sell our stupid show. And, uh, and, uh, so it was, it was kind of mostly PR hype. Now, there's, there were people who were upset, but not many. Oh, but there, there was also a really great moment. We had a very smart producer who brought us into New York, and he had a lot riding on the possibility that this little off-Broadway show might, might make or break him. It was his first independent production. And he had studied the way people in New York think about theater for a long time. And when he was about to bring us in, he said... For you, magic is the M word. You will not say it unless an interviewer asks you about it. It will not appear on any posters. It will not appear in anything that we put out. Let the critics discover that there's gonna be a little bit of magic in the show because if you say magic to the public, if you say they're coming to a magic show, the, the, the station wagons will arrive, ar arrive from the suburbs and they'll drop their kids off in front of the theater and no first string critic will ever take you seriously. And we learned from that. Wow. That's, that's, that's crazy. And then when we got, you know, there was a, we actually had the discussion. It was, it was rather formal. You know, uh, in about uh, the end of the 80s, we just said, you know, we are well known enough as Penn and Teller, we can now say we're magicians. And we can all of a sudden say, okay, that's what we're doing, you know? And you see that a lot in, uh, in show business. Is someone, in order to get some sort of traction, acts like they're, you know, rebellious in a brand new thing, and this is a whole different thing. And then once they get a certain level of success and their name is known a little bit, they just go back and embrace that. You know, um, you, you, people who are, uh, you know, Bob Dylan comes out as this whole new thing, and then a little while later says, you know, I'm a song and dance man. It's a, it's a formula that's used, and for a very, very good reason. You're trying to find something to identify you different from you know, the form you're working in, and then when once somebody knows your name, you can then kind of say that's what we're doing. But that, 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 that off-Broadway producer was very shrewd. Um, he, he, he wouldn't even put a subtitle on the show. He just said, oh, I'm gonna call, you're going to call this show Pen and Teller. And there won't be a little, the amazing evening of blah, 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 underneath it. It's going to be just Pen and Teller. And he said, let the audience decide what to call you. And it was very smart. Wow. And you know, some, something that, you know, uh, what, the temptation is always uh, with a promoter to say, so what is this thing? You know? <laughs> and he had the, he had the guts to, to not say. And, now, and so you guys have been doing your act now for over 38 years. And you guys go, and, and to stay relevant, you've also, you know, started doing television specials, several TV shows, but there's one TV show in particular where you seem to kind of depart from your place as entertainers and really put yourself on a pedestal as uh, skeptics. Oh, bullshit. <laughs> Eight seasons, the longest running show in the history of Showtime. Dex Dexter's now Titus. Oh! Someone has to kill me. Dexter. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk about 
where the idea for bullshit came about or in the process of which you guys went from the idea to getting on the air? Uh, every time they talked to us about doing a TV show, we, uh, we would try to say, let's do a skeptic show and be shot down. And then a producer in uh, LA had a skeptic show and wanted us to host it. And we kind of, in a certain sense, hijacked it. Um, and, uh, and what we wanted to bring to people was, um, uh, as a rule of thumb, um, the person that's right on TV is often the most measured and the quietest, and the nut is usually exploding and fascinating and full of life. So you get these debates where uh, television gravitates toward the nut. And really our pitch, there were a lot of parts of our pitch, but one of our, the parts of our pitch was we said we could be right and also be passionate and be out of our fucking minds. And um, uh, all we wanted to prove with bullshit was that we could be uh, as passionate and as aggressive as the people who were wrong. And that was a, that was a, that was a big part of the idea. And uh, uh, the reason uh, it was called bullshit was, you know, it was it was actually inaccurate. But Al Goldstein, who uh, 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 another person I look up to, a pornographer in uh, in New York, who did Screw Magazine and also did the important case with Topeka v. Goldstein, where he fought for um, being able to sit, freedom of speech across state lines, essentially in the mail service. Uh, and fought that all the way through. And I, I, he told me when I was doing Stern a lot, and I, I would go on Howard Stern, and then we would get a fax uh, at our office that would say something like, I want you to know how much I enjoyed listening to you carefully on the Howard Stern show, Uri Geller. Um, <laughs> and there, there might be a subtext to that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know what he meant by that, but you know, some people could guess. And um, and uh, I was told by Al Goldstein, who had been sued a zillion times, that you had to be very careful what you said. And Al Goldstein's advice to me was use obscenity. You know, the magic word is liar. If you say the word liar, uh, you're wide open for a lawsuit. If you say the word dipshit, pretty safe. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> we decided on bullshit that if we used a lot of obscenity, we could avoid the lawsuits. And everybody was kind of on board. It used to really make me laugh on the, um, on the chiro chiropractor episode. Um, we, had, we had some sort of word in there that said, you know, liar or falsehood or something like that. And, um, you know, there was, there was a memo. From the uh, from the legal people that said, couldn't you call this guy an asshole instead? <laughs> 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 so you know, um, uh, we were not allowed. The lawyers went crazy and said, you cannot say the word quack. The word quack is instant lawsuit. You cannot say the word quack. So I don't know if anybody uh, remembers the chiropractor. Uh, uh, segment, but we stood doing the monologue surrounded by ducks. <laughs> uh, and we said, you know, they can sue the ducks because they'll be saying quack, but we won't. Um, so the ducks said quack, 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 quack. And I said, baby twisting motherfucker. <laughs> the um, A similar. Uh, uh, one of the later episodes, a similar thing happened when you couldn't say the word pyramid scheme, right? Right. So, uh, so you could say multi-level marketing. Yeah. And you guys did the entire, uh, on the set of a pyramid. Yeah. <laughs> the pyramids behind The whole episode <laughs> took place and, in a pyramid. And we also mentioned Social Security during that one, which, was that a non sequitur? <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell her, what are some of the favorite issues you tackled in bullshit? I mean, all of them, I'm sure. I, I have a, a great fondness in my heart for the bottled water episode. <laughs> I just, because it, it wasn't just about bottled water, but it was also about, you know, the, 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 this, the psychological effect of, of 
pretentious presentation, which is fun to me. You know, when we, when we, we, sent, a, we sent an actor to play the role of Tim, your water steward, uh, <laughs> who would come to, come to the tables in a fancy LA restaurant and he would have a little, you know, rolly cart on top of which were uh, beautifully presented bottles of water with glorious labels, you know, that would show this is this this water is imported from a from a, a glacier. This is from the mountains of Japan. This is from France, which I believe used the phrase "piece du chat" as <laughs> part of its <laughs> identification. And uh, presented the the water for for tasting by the by the patrons, you know, who would taste it and you know sniff the bouquet of the water and comment on how they could feel the glacier in the water. They never commented on the cat. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, having concluded this wonderful presentation, where they had. Oh, oh, and generally speaking, they, they, they would, at some point they would say, oh, it's so good to be able to taste real water. The stuff I get out of my tap in Los Angeles is just horrible. And then Tim, the water steward, would reveal that in fact he had filled all of the bottles from the garden hose behind the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and it, something about that, just the, the comedic element of that was uh, really pleasing to me. Great. I think there, are, there should be some microphones Does, located. Doesn't Penn have a favorite one? I think the you know the last one we did we I have two favorites I like the Vatican episode that everybody always asks me why that didn't show up on the DVDs and I have an honest answer to that which is I don't know <laughs> they never said a word to us about it it just I was on Open Anthony the New York show and they had just gotten the new DVD and they said the Vatican episode isn't on this DVD and I went what I mean just <laughs> totally found out that and the other one was the um, because bullshit always had to be stated in the negative, right? That had to be bullshit. We had to do that anti-vaccine was bullshit. We couldn't do, you know, the, the syntax has to be that way. So um, I, I think that's the one I'm most proud of because um, the Jenny McCarthy and, I mean, all those people. Uh, and uh, the way, you know, uh, the, the Showtime people, who will not say anything bad about the Showtime was the only one who would support us on this. And so when I make a little joke about what they said, uh, I, I mean no disrespect toward them because no one else has ever done a skeptical show like that full out and Showtime stood behind us. And we're also, uh, I guess I'm not allowed to say this, but we are doing a pilot for what I consider to be the next step in bullshit for Showtime. Um, and don't act surprised because you're writing on it. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm surprised that you're saying it. It's not exactly a secret in this room. But, but. Uh, I'm not, I won't say anything more about that. But what they did say was that they didn't think the anti-vaccination -vac thing was sexy enough. And I said, well, we'll have all the science said by a topless woman with very large breasts. And they said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence Krauss, let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> I say implants, Lawrence. Implants. <laughs> we want to take some questions from people out in the audience. Uh, is there some? Is there a microphone? We're station? gonna we're gonna line up like we normally do on the far side over here. So please okay. come on over here, orderly. Uh, let me see before we start Q and A that uh, Penn and Teller will be at the book signing table. The, we have copies of Penn's book, of course, as well as copies of uh, multiple seasons of bullshit. So afterwards, go buy stuff because it makes the whole ship run. So line up right here. First question. We got time for just a couple. Question number one. Um, just real quick question. So cold reading as a mentalist or a psychic, some ethical issues. Do you think there's a space for cold reading within a magic show? Can it be performed morally and ethically in a magic show? I think I answered that. It is absolutely the sawing the woman in half rule. If anybody leaves that theater thinking that something is not true, there is no ethical or moral room for it. It is completely wrong. And that is what's wrong with all that. I'm getting little hints, all that sitting on the fence stuff. I think you, I mean, that is the ideal. And as I said, I violated that many times myself. Because when you're writing, it's so nice if you have a little bit of a red herring in there or something. But if you're asking me just the, where I think it is morally, I think you have to leave the theater 
with what you believe as the performer is the proper view of the universe. Yeah, I, I, for those of you who saw Play Dead the other night, you see exactly how, how we thought mentalism, you know, that, kind of, that kind of reading stuff should be handled, which is, uh, Todd would say, uh, I'm about to show you what can be done with the vulnerability. Here's a reading, that was a lie. <laughs> Uh, that was a lie. It was an immoral act on my part. Boy, am I a bastard. Boy, am I evil. Next lie. And, and, and play, played it for comedy, but repeatedly apologized for even a slight emotional effect that it might have on the person uh, so that there would not really be a moment of question. And still, and that made it better for the people in the theater because they left the theater going, okay, he's not psychic. How could he possibly know that stuff? That was a great trick. Any plan for later question, I think? Oh, no. We can't. You... <laughs> Next. Okay, so well, it's a really everybody quick... in the room knows it's you're really smarter quick question. than us. No, it, I just it's, want a, to ask... it's a zero sum. Yeah, it's a, yeah, no, I just want to ask, uh, you know, because you were giving me advice, I just want to ask you, Penn, where did you get your implants? <laughs> <laughs> From your mother. <laughs> Could the two of you speak a little bit about the relationship between your uh, skeptical activism and interests and politics? You know, uh... <laughs> I don't know, you know, um, a lot of bullshit's politics, our politics, uh, were not dug by the skeptical community. and. Uh, so uh, I don't think there's an overlap. Uh, skeptics try really, really hard to think that um, political decisions can be made based on skepticism. There's this sense, uh, and if you read the New York Times, they're always trying to make the sense that their position can be supported by science or by logic or by skepticism. And politics have uh, the issue deep underneath them at the bottom of how good you think people are and how you think they should live their lives and, uh, and how much force should be used. I mean, my whole, my whole political issue is how much force do we use for anything we want government to do? Where is the balance between force, uh, liberty and safety? Where is that balance? And I believe that that decision is not a decision that can be answered by science. Even if you can prove to me that a certain amount of force can be used on someone and make their life better in an objective way, I and mean, Sam Harris has written about this brilliantly, he's right. But even then, you have to deal with a moral issue of the way you want politics to work. And I think that I've tried myself to cheat and tried to prove that um, the skeptical position yields some sort of political position. And I think when I do that, I'm wrong. And I, I, I haven't really found a way that they connect. So on bullshit, we kind of saw it as a, uh, a libertarian show, an atheist show, and a skeptical show. And I know that many people disagree with this. I don't happen to. I believe that atheism and skepticism are the same. I, I do not believe that libertarianism is. And I don't believe you can make any case from science and skepticism and atheism that supports libertarianism. Uh, whatsoever. And uh, I know that there are people that consider libertarianism to be a pseudoscience and fight skepticism against that. I also think that's ridiculous. I think they're separate. And we tried to have them. They were not related except the fact that they were what we believed. Cool. And uh, I apologize to you guys. I see the line for me. We just have time for one more. So they will be signing books and everything. You can talk to them. I'd like to thank you both for the national exposure you're giving uh, to skepticism and atheism. Here in Las Vegas, we have a large number of atheists. We have about six atheist organizations. We have a united coalition of reason that's combining all of them. A uh, really large atheist meetup. Can you tell us what we all can do locally in our communities to publicize and to push the fact that it's okay to not believe in God. I, I am, I, I have such strong feelings about this. And it's an argument that I've had with people in this room. Um, and it, it, 
it, it may be a point that only exists in my head, but I'm still, I'm still going to say it. Um, I believe that the instant you ask the question, how can we convince more people to be atheists? How can we convince more people to be skeptic? At that instant that you ask that question, you have become a pig. Fearing not, I become my enemy in the instant that I preached, is what Bob Dylan said. I am all for proselytizing. I am all for telling the truth as you see it. But as soon as anybody, anybody stands on stage and says, this is the way you manipulate people. This is how to pick up girls. This is how to act. They are wrong. Because when, uh, when a Christian talks to me about Christianity, I should not have a script that I'm working through. I should not have a way to manipulate them, to convince them to my side. I should talk with them as a human being. So all these little lectures about when someone talks to you about UFOs, why not say to them, is there any other explanation you can think of that is condescending, that is wrong? It is more respectful, if that's the kind of person you are, and it is the kind of person I am, to say, fuck you, you're wrong. That, <laughs> that shows that you're dealing with an adult. You know, and you are always dealing with adults and you always have to be yourself. So you tell the truth from your heart, you tell the truth as you see it, and you cannot have an agenda. And there is no special secret for how you talk to women, there's no special secret for how you talk to Christians, there's no special secret for how you talk to UFO nuts. You talk to people respectfully as equals and you do that honestly. Organizations of atheists who want to get together and have fun and share ideas and be like-minded, I believe that's a beautiful thing. But outreach programs that use any sort of social engineering or any sort of manipulation drive me crazy. In the room somewhere here is one of my dear friends, uh, John Whiteside, who I call super atheist, who's the one in Vegas who put up billboards who said there is no God. What I love about that is he is stating his opinion in an open freedom of speech forum. This is what I believe. But there's not manipulation. So although I'm all for those organizations and I belong to some of them and I always want to hang out and I, you know, and I want to play rock and roll for them, um, uh, all of that, I don't want to ever get into the how do you convince people. You know, whenever you get into uh, on every level that it is, this is how you sell Amway, this is how you pick up girls, this is the way you sell used cars. At that instant you become a pig, you just need to tell the truth as you see it. So I will join your organization, I'll play music for it, I'll speak from my heart, but I won't speak about how you suck people in using trickery because those are chick tracks. That's what the other side does and the reason one of the reasons I'm an atheist is I don't want to play that manipulation social engineering game. So that's my feeling. Um, and uh, before we let you guys go, we just want to bring out uh, Randy for a moment. Randy, come on out here. Again. Amazing Randy. Oh, Penn, you don't, you don't want to stand up. I um, never thought I'd make this confession, but here it is. I feel quite inadequate standing here to do this very simple task. I'm not uh, quite up to it, and I, uh, I'm having a hard time with it, frankly, because I'm afraid I'm going to break down. I'll try not to. I'll spare you that terrible sight. The two guys standing on the stage with me here are my giants. One of them more than the other, of course. <laughs> they are my giants. They are people that I have such respect for that I certainly can't express it in mere words. You know, integrity is the one word that comes to mind when I think of Penn and Teller. They have stuck with their principles through all these years 
They have never disappointed any of us by lacking integrity in the way they think, what they do, the way they design their act, and the way they speak about any matter that is brought up. And um, that was sort of proven to me quite some years ago. They have a workshop here in Las Vegas, as you might strongly suspect, where, where they develop illusions and routines for rehearsal purposes. This is set aside for that very function. And I uh, had the occasion to drop in when they were in the middle of developing a new illusion. I could see that they were working very, very hard on it, and they were doing a lot of yelling at one another, too, as you might expect between partners. Yeah. Pen more than teller. <laughs> and uh, as you can also imagine. And uh, I saw them f flailing around with this thing, and I left before I got involved in it. And uh, I think about two years passed. And uh, I got back to them again, and I, I saw the show here at the theater, and uh, I, I asked them afterwards, but guys, what about that, that routine you were working on with the big cloth and the whole thing? And I've forgotten which one of them answered me. Could have been either one of them. He simply said to me, well, it, it wasn't quite pen and teller enough. Now, that's, that speaks a lot right there. Because what they do on their stage as entertainers and what they say right here in front of audiences like this as well has to be pen and teller. It has to match their thoughts, their integrity, their principles, and their purposes in life. Integrity is the word that I would write above them in, in flames if I could manage it. Do you think we could work on an effect like that? <laughs> I think I'll bet we come up with something. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm about to present to Penn and Teller is only an object. It's a very small object, and it will take its place among other things that, that have been given to them over the years. Um, can we place it on the table here, do you think, Carrie? Among the water bottles, or let's, let's, can we get rid of those? Okay. Thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, again, this is a very small token. The object itself doesn't uh, say very much, but it's, we, we designed it from the heart, and the inscription on the plaque at the front is very simple, very brief, but we mean it very, very sincerely. Ladies and gentlemen, to Penn and Teller, a small globe of the earth that turned through mysterious means. <laughs> no, it's highly technical, the way this thing is designed to turn, and the inscription on the front of it reads, but could you hold the world for me for just a moment, please? Thank you. Don't shake it. <laughs> Presented to Penn and Teller at TAM 2012 with our love and gratitude. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you so much. We love you, don't we? Let's hear it. Ladies and gentlemen, Amanda, Randy, Amazing Randy, Penn and Teller. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Which, is, uh, which I didn't understand how that was possible until I uh, met Teller and Randy. So it's kind of, Teller was much hipper to all uh, the kind of nuances of when it's okay to lie and when it's not. But I was very, very confused by that. And uh, Teller and Randy kind of uh, led me by the hand. And uh, Randy was just, you know, I've said this many times, outside of my family, outside of people genetically related to me, um, no one is more important in my life. Uh, Randy's everything to me. That's amazing. That is amazing. And, and last night, right he referred to you guys as brothers, so I know that the feeling is he said mutual. He, he said something more important than that. Did you hear what he said last night? After we did To Sir With Love, he said, I love them like brothers, I love them like lovers. Oh. And uh, that's when I started crying last night, because uh, that's good. That ramps it up a wicked lot for me. Sure does. And it gets hotter for everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So tell her, let's talk a little bit about this. So, so when he talks about cl- when it's okay to lie or how to lie in magic, you got into magic very early on. So when did the ethics of doing magic play in your development of magic? Uh, almost not until I met Penn, really. Uh, Penn, uh, I, I, magic didn't, didn't have for me a moral component, I think, until I hung with Penn, who is, as you know, very clear in his morality. Um, <laughs> Um, it, for me, I was I was fascinated by by magic because the most important decision that you make in your life at any given on stage here. Um, talk about a little bit. Let's talk about Randy. Uh, did you all know of him before you got together, or was it after you got together when you we kind of discovered Randy and, and your admiration for Randy? That uh, information has been lost. Uh, The three of us tell stories of Randy and how we met, and I believe all three of us tell different stories. Do you? Somebody was really arrogant. Like, sure, I'll Mike Teller. Sure, why not? Yeah, let me see here. Hold on a second. We got this. This is just really wicked funny. Strangely, I have some information. Woo! It's just, uh, it, it's, it was odd, but I was looking through some ancient notebooks of mine today, and I found a letter, uh, a, a draft of a letter to Randy saying that we were going to be at the, uh, the, this, this conference for college bookings, and oh, yeah. that we were dying to meet him. I, that's all I can say. So we, we, we knew he was going to be there. It wasn't a random encounter, and it was a sort of a fan letter to him. Well, you know, I, I know that while I was in high school, I don't know, because someone's going to tell me that it was a different year, but I believe when I was in high school, I read Flim Flam. Okay. And Randy had already started changing my life. But the way Randy tells the story is that he put us together. And uh, <laughs> I... I would say that that's the lie that tells the greater. I'm going to introduce one of the uh, writers. I'm sure you all have seen the show, Penn and Teller, Tell a Lie. This is, uh, please make him feel welcome. This is Matt Donnelly. How's it going, everybody? Good evening. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to be moderating uh, today's discussion. And uh, please, welcome to the stage your guests for the last uh, 38 years. They have been defying the laws of physics and also sometimes good taste. Please welcome to the stage, Penn and Teller. Critical pen and teller are do a whole show against bottled water, then they come out with bottled water. <laughs> we actually dump these out and put tap. Exactly. Uh, and let's just be clear, uh, just for today's discussion, teller, you are indeed Mike, so you'll be speaking uh, to everybody here today. <laughs> All right, and uh, to start things off, I saw you guys talking with Randy just before we came out. I mean, um, if we hadn't both been fans of Randy, we wouldn't get together. And certainly, and I've said this many times, it's just simply true, that uh, if not for Randy, there would not be Penn and Teller as we are today. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Uh, the, um, you know, uh, I've told this story so many times, I, I won't tell it now, but um, I, uh, as a child, was very, very bothered by Kreskin and humiliated by Kreskin, and um, uh, I actually lost uh, all of my respect for science and all of my respect for magic. I didn't have a lot for magic, but I mean, <laughs> the, the little bit that I had, I lost. And, um, and it was Teller and Randy together that gave me um, 
the piece of information I needed. And uh, I didn't understand before hours of conversation with Teller and reading a lot of Randy, then meeting Randy, that you could take the worst thing possible, which is lying uh, to people knowingly, and make that an okay thing by putting a proscenium around it. And whether, uh, whether you want to use any of the cliches of honest liar or any of those things, however you put that, the idea that to say that you're a taxi driver when really you're an actor is an immoral thing to do, unless you're doing a movie called Taxi Driver and you're Robert De Niro, and when it's in the, in the theater, it's okay. So uh, Teller and I work really hard to um, not tell lies, but do magic. Which given moment is what is really going on there. You can't make any decisions beyond that until you make that decision. And magic is this wonderful place where if you make, if you make a mistake on that in real life, if, you, if, you, if you're in a situation and you don't really know what's going on uh, and you don't think there's a truck coming at you and the truck uh, is there and it comes at you and you make a mistake about that, that can be a very fatal sort of thing. If you go to the car dealership and the car dealer lies to you and you buy a bad car, that's a very severe thing. If, on the other hand, your, uh, it, it, what magic does is magic allows you to play with that most difficult of all, with that, that most important possible decision in a situation where it doesn't matter. In fact, it's a situation where if you get it wrong, if you don't know where reality is and, and make-believe begins, you're perfectly happy with it because you're, you're just there to have fun. It's like, a, it's like a playground for that particular skill uh, that is so important elsewhere. Great. And now, when it comes to... <laughs> What's great about that, man? That was, great. That was just great. That's my... I took a, uh, a transition class, and great was the first lesson. <laughs> I, 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 I always excel at, uh-huh. Oh, good, yeah. Uh-huh. I'll, I'll go to lesson two if you want. Fascinating. <laughs> no, um, so, no, and so, you know, being in, you know, the skeptic atheist community, bringing that into your work, you know, that you were into entertainment first. Talk about, you know, the, the you know, growing up as entertainers and then becoming kind of skeptic or atheist.